Yeah, yeah, yeah! Come and take a look at the snow. Bright white as far as your eyesight goes. Come and take a look at the fields of snow. I'll just get my coat, then we're good to go. Come and take a look at the lake. Let's have a quick skate before it gets late. Come and take a look at the frozen lake. Put your clothes on, mate. Don't make that mistake. Ba 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 ba. Greetings, holiday shoppers. There are now 36 shopping days left until Christmas, and I think you know what that means. That means it's time for another episode of Christmas Creeps, your one-stop shop for holiday movies and TV shows and all that fun stuff all year round. Hi, my name is Joseph Wade. I will be your host for this evening. Here with me tonight is my co-host, Johnny Five, the human robot. Hello. John, what is going on with you, sir? Uh, I took a bunch of DayQuil, and now I can breathe and talk again, so... Oh, so we hit we hit it at just the right time, and this yeah. is this is this is your episode tonight. So I hope you're ready. We have two special guests with us tonight. Uh, our our pal Booker is back again. Booker, what's going on? Hey, it's well good to be back. Glad to have you back. Uh, and um, her first time on the show, uh, we have uh, Jesse joining us tonight. Jesse, what's going on with you? Hello, not much. Um, so what are your holiday credentials? If you would. Uh, I worked retail in the biggest mall in New York State for a decade, and also I've seen Christmas Story approximately 500 times. That is all we need. That's exactly what we want and why we have you on the show, because I want to believe each one of us is a veritable Christmas Story expert. Uh, tonight. I mean, I would, hope, I would hope so, considering it's run, you know, 12 times uh, in a day for the last 20 some odd years. Yeah, it's kind of inescapable, and depending on how you feel about it, that's either a good thing or a terrible thing. But yes, tonight's show is uh, sort of our, our capper for Clark's giving uh, as we discuss uh, Bob Clark's 1983 absolute classic, A Christmas Story. Um, now, John, you've actually read the uh, the Gene Shepard books, have you not? Uh, it's been years, but yeah. Okay. Uh, has, has anybody else familiar with, with the original stories? I'm not. I've always meant to get around to it and just never did. Okay. I've read uh, In God We Trust. I haven't read any of his other stuff, though. Okay. Well, the In God We Trust is, is primarily where the film comes from. Uh, so that's kind of going to be the thing that we uh, get into tonight. Uh, but, John, did, did we r- – remind me. Did we have uh, something else we, want, we needed to uh, discuss before we dig into Christmas Story tonight? Um, is this a segue about Elf on the Shelf? Because I totally didn't bother with any of that shit yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's right. We were going to talk about Elf on the Shelf, but uh, uh, maybe next week. <laughs> okay, John. So I'm going to throw it over to you real quick. So uh, real quick, tell us a little bit about uh, A Christmas Story. Why are you putting me on the damn spot making me do shit? Because uh, it's, uh, it's fun. Gene- so uh, Bob Clark <laughs> wanted to do this movie with Gene Shepard. They worked on it for like 10 years trying to get this to come together. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Clark agreed to do Porky's 2 was so that they would finance him doing Christmas Story. Right. Um, it's a combination of several different stories that have been God We Trust All Those Pay Cash, along with um, some out of other books, like the uh, – I want to say the Bumpus Hounds thing is out of Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories. And then the thing about getting your stung tucked to a pole is not published. This is from another story he just told a bunch on tour. mm but like in the in the books, the Bumpus Hounds thing is one story. The uh, the BB Gun thing is another story. Grover Dill is another story. The the Dakota Ring is another story. The Lamp is another story. It's it's seriously like eight or nine stories all jammed together into one narrative, and it works surprisingly. Which you you see other th- like kind of anthology or sketch things that get turned into a narrative. And sometimes it doesn't quite come together. Like Empire Records, it just gets stretched kind of thin, saying all of this shit happened in one day. Um, Super Troopers kind of gets by with it because they just fudge it and they don't really tell you how long it takes. Um, Christmas Story kind of does that too. It, it it takes place sometime in December, but you don't really know how long it takes. It could have been like a week before Christmas. could have been the three weeks before Christmas. Well, and all the things that happen in it are also things that make sense happening around the holidays like your furnace being shit and your dad fighting with the neighbor dogs that end up stealing your turkey like nothing in it yeah. is that out of place for the season and i think that helps a lot the way we've kind of built the holidays around uh you know christmas and in and, and throughout december like december is just like one long sort of haze where it all kind of runs together after a while so it kind of makes sense that 
this is really episodic because you know, one thing just kind of leads into the next, leads into the next. It doesn't really matter that it's all episodic. Are you suggesting that a Christmas story is responsible for Christmas being a 25 day long holiday? I mean, <laughs> I not, mean, not saying that. <laughs> it's not, not true. Yeah. I mean, I, that's actually fairly apropos because I mean, the way that, that they've taken this movie and they've sort of forced it. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say it forced it on people year after year, the way they do. Yeah. This it's, one of the things that has really uh, cr- created the modern like holiday uh, in- industrial complex is a Christmas story. Thanks, Ted Turner, I guess. Because, yeah, so this movie was sold to uh, Warner Brothers in 1986 as part of a package deal. It was literally sold as, as a fi- in part of a like a 50 film package and they th- and uh, MGM threw this one in just to complete, you know, the lineup of 50 films. They really didn't care that they even had it in their slate. Mm. And actually, I'm gonna, I need to back up because I want to talk a little bit about, like, when this came out, because I think that's interesting. Uh, so this movie was released, like, November 18th, 1983, the same week as the original Sleepaway Camp and Amityville 3D. Ooh. <laughs> All star lineup that week, guys. I mean, two out of three ain't bad, right? Who the hell is releasing horror movies like two weeks after Halloween? Nineteen eighties, <laughs> man. You could do that. I mean, that's just just that's what the November is for, like Halloween holdovers and stuff too early for Christmas, right? Yeah. But by the time Christmas came around, this movie was gone. It had vanished, and films released December ninth, nineteen eighty three. John Carpenter's Christine, Scarface, Sudden Impact, and Terms of Endearment. And meanwhile, A Christmas Story, nowhere to be seen. Like, if you wanted to go see A Christmas Story or at you know, Christmas in 1983, you really couldn't do it. And that's mostly to MGM's, you know, fault. Um, but the movie did actually make money. Like, it cost $4 million and it made $16 million at the box office. So, like... By the technical terms of what constitutes a blockbuster, like a movie making back four times its budget, that kind of that kind of counts. But uh, it was, you know, a, a minor success, and it sort of disappeared for a couple of years until it got sold to Warner Brothers, who at the time was also in bed with you know Ted Turner and the, and his entire broadcasting corporation. And according to the Christmas Story House website, uh, they say that. TBS was the first to run the Christmas Story Marathon as a stunt in 88, but a lot of but everyone else says it's 1997 on TNT. I'm not sure what to make of that. I mean, the first T stands for the same thing, so does it really matter? Not really, but I mean, there's a whole 11 no, 9 years to account for there. I I would say probably just to synthesize two stories, probably what happened was TBS started showing it regularly then and then it turned into the whole like 48 72 hours of the christmas story by 97 on tnt so okay i guess my next question is do you think they started the marathon on purpose or was it just as like a goofy stunt goofy stunt 110 percent. it was someone being like you know we could i could just put the same movie on 47 times and not have to come to work tomorrow <laughs> they were thinking what who's going to be watching television on christmas no, they they absolutely did it as, like, a goofy stunt, and then it accidentally turned out to be, like, incredibly popular. And they were just like, oh, this is fine. <laughs> There's a bit of logic to it, though, because, like, if it's on all day, you're never going to not be able to catch it. You're not going to be like, oh, it's one thirty. Christmas Story started 15 minutes ago. You're going to be like, oh, it's one thirty. Time to wait another hour and a half for it to start or, again. And this is, I don't know anybody who's actually done it. The way I always know people to watch it is you turn on the TV, you catch 15 minutes, you come back an hour later, you catch another 15 minutes, and you just cumulatively see the movie over the course of a day because you've seen it so many times in 2019 that it doesn't really matter where you come in at. And it's so episodic that you can watch the little vignettes like separately from one another and still get the whole movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like then that's that's typically the way my family kind of experiences a Christmas story each year is like we wake up Christmas morning, turn on the TV, there it is. We see you know we see Flick. Uh, wait, I'm I'm getting my people mixed up here. No, we see Flick um, gets his tongue stuck to the pole. Flick gets his tongue stuck to the. Thank you. I'm. Ugh. We see Flick gets his. <laughs> appreciate it. 
We see Flick getting his tongue stuck to the pole. You know, we open presents. We go over to my uncle's house. They have it on. We catch, you know, the Scud Farkas affair. We go back home, come back later, and Ralphie gets his uh, Red Rider BB gun. And you go to bed having seen it one time out of the 12 showings that they air. So, yeah, like you said, cumulatively, you see, you catch it at least once. But, like, putting it on 24-7 guarantees that, like, every family who has their Christmas tradition set at a different time of day gets to experience it at some point. I, so. I genuinely, because of watching it that way, could not tell you what order things happen in because I've seen it out of order <laughs> so many times in the last 20 years. Oh, no, yeah. Like, I even re rewatched it again last night. I still probably couldn't, couldn't like, correctly tell you which thing happens when. When I watched it for the to be on the episode, I w I think it was the first time I've ever seen the movie completely start to finish without a break in the middle. Oh wow! Okay, so so Booker, uh, what what was that experience like? It was just it. I I never really realized for one thing just how little dialogue Ralphie actually has in the film, yeah, <laughs> and it sort of puts a finer point on it when you watch it all at once. Yeah, to put a number on it because IMDb gives you a number, he has ninety three lines. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, we're, we've jumped straight into it because I don't think A Christmas Story really needs any introduction. I mean, if you haven't seen A Christmas Story, you know, just wait till Christmas Eve. It'll be on 12 times. <laughs> yeah, who the hell has cable anymore? Uh, you know, wh which whichever streaming service gets A Christmas Story and decides to put up some kind of a... I mean, you can't really replicate the marathon on a streaming service, can you? Unless you just make the only thing available a Christmas story. Like, so this marathon is in danger of going extinct at some point. You, you, so what's up with Disney Plus just being absolute bullshit, by the way? <laughs> I mean, it's called Disney. You can just assume. There you go. Um, no, I think you can do it, but you need a streaming service that actually has a dedicated stream, like something like Shudder, where you can just, just um, come in and do uh, You need a, like a Pluto channel. Oh, like a what? Like a channel on Pluto. Yeah, like a Pluto which channel. Which Pluto, Pluto does have channels like that just stream the same thing 24-7. Yep. Um, and, and, Pl and Pluto does have a Christmas channel right now. So yeah. um, you you might catch uh, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians or Bone Alone or whatever cheap crap they could get their hands on. But yeah, they do have that. But there's also like Shudder, the, the horror service, has mm -hmm. like, like three streams that they just leave up that are different things. And they cycle through a loop. Um, and you can absolutely... Do something like that on a Netflix or a Disney Plus where you just loop that movie 12 times for a day and then, okay, it's back to the other stream now. Yeah, and like they, they could even, like Netflix or whoever, could even build it so that you're kind of watching the Christmas story in like a setting where you've got, you know, the Yule Log going and a holiday theme kind of on the screen. If you're just really sad and desperate, I guess. <laughs> and there's ways to do it. I mean, Netflix does do, they, they do show like Yule Logs on Netflix now, so it's possible. Don't tell me it's not. <laughs> That's depressing. Just log into the, the Yule Log whenever you're ready for it. I mean, yeah. They do that. On-demand Yule Log. If, if that's not a perfect, like, metaphor for the, our streaming hellscape that we live in, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I mean, I think it just a real fire is pretty on-demand in most good situations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so should we go through the major events of this film, like, beat by beat? I mean, if you haven't seen A Christmas Story, why are you listening to us? But if you have, you know... Why are you listening to us? Why are you listening to us at all? To start off, um, it should be noted that it's 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 pretty uh, nebulous when this film takes place. I mean, there are clues and there are um, little things that you, that you can point to to kind of pinpoint a date, but it's va kind of vaguely just the early 1940s. And they all contradict each other as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, the big one to me is that the Wizard of Oz t is, you know, a presence in this film. And that was 1939. So, yeah, but as someone pointed out, though, like the one date you can actually see is on Ralphie's decoder pin. It says 1940. Yeah. But if it was 1940 with how much like Disney promotion there is of Snow White and Mickey, there's no way there wouldn't be Pinocchio shit going around, too. Well, so, I, yeah, and. And a lot of the Christmas music was specifically from like the like forty two, forty three, forty four. Mm -hmm. So it, it it runs back and forth, intentionally trying to blur the lines. So it's just like any Christmas USA, basically. 
yeah, it, it kind of just it doesn't really matter when it's just it is the 40s. And so this is I mean, this is the whole thing is built around like nostalgia. So and nostalgia is yeah. kind of a, a, a moving target anyway. So yeah, it, and also for some like reverse summer of 69 bullshit, Gene Shepard was like 20 something in the 40s. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, so see, that's a situation where like if, if we were getting the true like uncut Gene Shepard experience, I mean, you're basically watching a Christmas story, too, at that point. And nobody needs that yeah. shit. Nobody needs that. Or Ralphie is a fucking... That's not real. I've never heard of that. That doesn't exist. I've I've completely erased the last 30 seconds from my mind, just in case. Oh no, the Mandela effect has finally taken hold of this podcast. Uh, we're in the... Apparently you're from the alternate timeline where they made a sequel, and I'm from the timeline that's good, where they didn't do such an awful cursed thing. Are, are you also from the timeline that has no Christmas Story sequels at all? Because there are like three of them. Ha <laughs> ha! I'm also from the timeline that doesn't have a Christmas Vacation sequel. Oh so you live in a timeline that I want to live in, because if I lived in that timeline, I probably wouldn't be doing this show, and I would be free of this nightmarish existence of mine. We also skipped over Sleepaway Camp and went directly to Sleepaway Camp 2. It's real weird. <laughs> <laughs> what is this magical device that you have and you're, you clearly have in your possession? Why are you talking to us? It's the power of denial, friends. Oh, my God. Cultivated. Anyway, so yes, let's not talk about a, whatever a Christmas story two is any longer. Someone else, please take the reins and talk about the plot because I don't know what I'm talking about. All right, so uh, the plot is a kid asks for a BB. Yes. <laughs> the plot is Ralphie asks for a BB gun uh, in increasingly convoluted ways to try and make sure he gets what he wants for Christmas. Uh, along the way. Th- Goofy stuff happens involving his family, just little vignettes of things that would happen around the holidays. Uh, he gets in a fight with a bully. Someone gets their tongue sucked to a flagpole. Uh, at the end of the movie, after everybody else has shot him down, his dad, the only person he didn't ask for the BB gun, gets it for him as a surprise. Which is my actual favorite part of that movie. And you know, that's actually something that had never occurred to me before, that that the old man is the one who actually comes through in the... Like, I know that he does, but like... Yep. Not, it's because Ralphie doesn't ever go to him specifically. And it's not even that Ralphie doesn't ever go to him. He just doesn't think to ever go to him because you didn't go to your dad in 1940, whatever. Yeah, like, your dad was just a guy who just showed did. up and ate and went to sleep after he got over work. And, and, the, and that's very much how the old man is portrayed in the movie. Uh, the only time Ralphie really interacts with him outside of like the, the kitchen scenes is when he sneaks the ads into their magazines in the bedroom. Um, but other than that, like he never directly asks him for anything at all. Yeah, because most of Ralphie's interaction with his dad is is predicated on whether or not he's going to be punished. Because like you've got the the yep. fudge scene and whether he's going to be worried about getting beat up for beating up Scott Farkas. And... That's, no, no, I want to correct that. He is not worried about getting in trouble for beating the shit out of the bully. He is worried about getting in trouble because he swore while he was beating the shit out of the bully. <laughs> really. Oh, yes. yeah. yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, because the Scud Fargus thing happens after the O Fudge thing, right? Yes. Yeah. He, he, oh. he's, yeah, he, he, there's specifically like a Gene Shepard voiceover line that says he's not really worried about the fight. He's worried about the profanity during the fight. That's right. The awful things that I said. Oh, my God. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, Absolutely incredible. That's amazing. <laughs> Never caught that somehow. But yeah, but you're right. That those are the things that like a kid in the 1940s would be worried about, not fighting, because fighting is just what happens. When I watched the movie, I watched it with the director's commentary, and uh, he said that the actual like things that he says when he's beating up Scott Farkas were completely scripted by Gene Shepard, and he had a specific like set of cue cards he had to memorize for the gibberish that he's yelling while he hits him. <laughs> Well, incredible. Well, I know the old man had a, had a similar thing going on because, like, he he was very cognizant of the fact that this was supposed to be a PG film, and he absolutely could not swear at the furnace the way he wanted to. <laughs> one of the things I read, I think, on Wikipedia was that one of the people that like worked at the actual Higby's store, like the real one, um, wanted to have like a pass on the script for like profanity to tone it down a little bit in exchange for letting them use Higby's. Huh. Uh, they they were either successful or they had nothing to do because I mean this is a fairly tame movie in that regard. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a couple of there's a couple of bombs that drop, but they're very very precision. Mm-hmm. Like the only one I can think of off the top of my head is Ralphie saying "son of a bitch" when uh, exactly with the the Dakota ring ad. <laughs> That's such a good delivery too. <laughs> you son of you, a you bitch. You feel the yeah. anger and just like disappointment in in that kid's voice. 
the only the only thing other thing off the top of my head is that when the dogs finally destroy the turkey, the dad runs out the door and just yells, "You son of a bitch, Bumpuses!" Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Real it was. I think that was the only two times in the movie that I can think of. Yeah, yeah, they got that. It got really like that. It really got explicit, I guess, to an extent. And then, of course, there in, in uh, my favorite detail is like in the O oh, fudge scene after the fact when his mom is washing his mouth out with soap, and he kind of lies to lies to her and says oh schwartz told me taught me this word and she goes to call schwartz's mother on the phone she stuffs the par of soap back in robbie's mouth and he, you just hear him go rrr, rrr. like he's oh oh fuck he said it again <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck Robbie, god and then hey how about how about uh the sound effect of schwartz's mom beating him to death <laughs> Uh, yeah. That part, yeah, I'm surprised That's Schwartz showed back up. As I got older. I'm, I'm surprised Schwartz showed up again in the movie. It's like, oh, that character didn't die. I guess that's why they had him show up, just so we know. Oh, he's not actually in the hospital with massive head wounds. It's like when you see Flick again with his uh, mouth all bandaged up. Oh man. <laughs> so I, I I watched this on a, a, a Blu-ray DVD, and one of the, a, a detail I never noticed was when he's coming back into the room, you just see his mouth just drooling like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. it's, oh god i feel so bad for these kids i really do and the fort it sucked to be alive in the 40s what can i say yeah <laughs> like it's it's it sucks now to be alive but for completely different reasons mm-hmm. yeah i mean what what, are you, what else are you supposed to do when the only thing you have for dinner every night of every meal is me, uh, meatloaf and mashed potatoes and red cabbage like every single meal like that just drives you crazy right it's it's one of the things where yeah you you when you watch it in pieces you don't really notice that like every single time they're having the meal it's the same it's the same food yeah <laughs> which is another clue that maybe this might be during world war ii because their their meals are clearly being like rationed and prepared like they have to have the same thing every night because that's how they know how much food they have it's, there's so many weird little details like that that are great jokes, but also just like completely baffling bits of world building. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The attention to detail. This movie, it, it's incredible they made it on such a small budget and made it feel so completely realistic. Mm-hmm. Well, a big part of that is the fact that like once they settled on shooting in the city of Cleveland, like apparently every every like collector and antique shop in town sort of came together to provide them with antique stuff from the 40s to really make the film look like the 40s and they really did a great job of that like you still it's kind of hard to imagine this is a movie that came out and was produced in the 80s because it just has it it nails that old look so well yeah yeah i genuinely was surprised to learn that it was made in 1983 Mm -hmm. (laughs) this movie came out after return of the jedi yeah, I mean, if you just Oof. if if someone just sat you down and watched this and was like, when did this movie come out? You'd be like, I don't know, the '60s. That's when all this nostalgia co- shit comes out. Twenty years after the fact, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that especially because it's such a well observed picture of the '40s. Like, you don't get that forty years later generally. No, you don't. And and it's like you either get it right then or you get a very deliberate like version of that observation of a period. You get like a Mad Men where it's like a. It's well observed, but it's very sterile in it, and this feels very lived in and realistic. Yeah, I think that's kind of that might be one reason why this movie like still has holds that status as being like one of the one of the greats of like Christmas movies, just because like nostalgia is a hell of a drug, and this movie kind of deploys it in ways that most others don't. You know, eighties nostalgia for the forties is just not a thing that anyone cares about, but. It's so unique in and of itself that I think it's it just kind of works and it resonates just because that like the actual f- nostalgia of the 40s isn't what the movie's really concerned with. It's well, and I think that it it helps that it's it helps that it's based on an actual person's you know slightly adjusted memories of an actual time yeah, period yeah. as opposed to like as opposed to so you have like real experiences as opposed to like a stranger things which is just like checklist of what do i have to hit to make this the 80s show mm-hmm. yeah it's a lot more authentic you know? that way because it's it's more content to just be a lived experience rather than a like idealized hey, remember one. this yeah yeah there's there's no very deliberate shot of a movie theater with like with like a hey, it's the one movies you remember from this year on it, like every other period piece has that now. 
So yeah, the Wizard of Oz and just like Mickey Mouse and Disney in general, those are like the the perfect kind of touchstones for like where kids are at in 1939, 1940, 1941. Yeah. And then of course Little Orphan Annie and Red Rider. Yes. Yes. And so yeah, the uh, the radio drama uh, stuff is the thing that I think that really helps ground it in terms of like what media they were consuming. Because I think that's like the only media you really see them like interacting with at any point other than like yeah, Life magazine. Yeah. Well, also like the Red Rider BB gun is a like a branded uh, BB gun for from like a, a Western comic, if I'm not mistaken. So like Red Rider is, is a, uh, it's comic a comic book character. T- right yeah yeah i believe so hang on uh it is also um a subline of uh daisy who still make bb guns uh you can actually get a red rider bb gun now Mm -hmm. yeah i think my dad had one when i or i mean when he was growing up and so so when i had it when i was growing up i I wonder if they would still make those if this movie wasn't such a like colossal part of the zeitgeist oh absolutely not yeah i mean i i got one for christmas and i was like uh, eight or nine but at that point the movie was already like a capital t thing so i mean that was clearly the reason we're making these because of the movie exactly well wait like B- uh, red riders specifically no i got I, no, it totally has red rider stock yeah <laughs> oh no, yeah right. the, like the red rider like the, the christmas story gun is like one of daisy's like top sellers to this day because of that movie yep it's the same reason yeah, it's the yeah. same reason that swing line makes red staplers now because of fucking office space <laughs> which they didn't do originally. Yeah, so they had to just make their own red swing line stapler, which seems crazy to me. Which like, I'm what? imagining too with Office Space, like the entire thing was what, work, what, like, what should Milton be obsessed with? Uh, it's a red swing line. That way, it's like if you worked in Office, you're like swing line. You might be like swing line doesn't make a red one because that makes it stand out more. Is like the, oh, this is a really weird specific thing he has. Right, like that's why it's special and that's why he wants it. Uh, we're getting off topic though. Um... So it, this movie, you can kind of compartmentalize it because there is the main story with the BB gun, but then there's all the other stories that kind of weave through it and it'll like shift back and forth. Like the little for Nanny story and the bully story are kind of happen simultaneously. Um, so the basic parts of it are, yeah, there's the story with the bullies, which uh, it's Scott Farkas and Grover Dill um, are just constantly tormenting the other kids in class, which Scott Farkas is Zach Ward, who was also in, among other things, Resident Evil. Uh, I know him as he's the first soldier who gets killed in the Michael Bay Transformers movie. Is he really? Yeah, it's Zach Ward. And Grover Dill is played by uh, Yano Anaya, who is the the $2 kid from Better Off Dead. Whoa, yeah. really? <laughs> oh my god. And um, that story, it just goes back, it's just, it's just you constantly see scenes of... Of the three main children, uh, Ralph, the four main children, actually, Ralph, Randy, uh, Flick, and Schwartz getting chased by them until finally after Ralph finally gets shot down by the teacher about the BB gun, he just snaps and just beats the shit out of Scott where, yeah, if his mom hadn't showed up, he probably would have killed that kid. Oh, yeah, he would have given that kid like the beating of a lifetime. (laughs) That's the one scene in the film that I I always... to this day still kind of gets me because like I remember being that kid who was constantly picked on and I just wanted to beat the shit out of him and I don't know seeing Ralphie lay into Scott Farkas is very cathartic to me for yeah because at, at the at the end of it like by the time his mom showed up Ralph just has like Scott by the neck and is just bashing his head into the ground basically <laughs> he's basically just choking the life out of him um but then there's a uh, yeah there he while he's trying to get this BB gun he kind of plants ads at his mom's uh, magazines he just straight out tells her and she's like no you'll shoot your eye out he writes a story of uh, a theme for Christmas uh, what I want for Christmas which it's a very fourth grader paper it's like three sentences and it takes up an entire page just saying mm-hmm. I want a BB gun my favorite um, uh, my favorite detail about that is he specifically says, I don't think a football is a good present. And then when he sees Santa later, Santa's like, you want a football? And he's just like, yeah, because yeah. yeah, he's too yeah. freaked yeah. out. His teacher does the same thing. Sure, it's, you'll, see your, <laughs> you'll shoot your eye out and gives him a C plus on the paper, which is hilarious. C plus? It's, it's like, what's his name? I forget who it was, calling Chevy Chase medium talent. <laughs> just like, you, you don't even get the, digni- like, the dignity of me being really mad at you. I'm just dismissing you. <laughs> 
So one thing that's always stuck out to me in that scene is when the teacher's handing back all the papers, and she says she was disappointed in the margins. And it makes me think some of the kids are writing very thin papers on these pa- on these you know pieces of like yeah, it's it's, it's paper. They're, they're doing the uh, the college thing where you adjust yeah. your margins to try yeah, and stretch like, a paper out that extra half yeah, a like page, double space, like, three inch margins with, their, with pencils, <laughs> but like doing it by hand with a pencil, yeah. <laughs> That's dedication. That is, yeah. That's dedication to bullshitting. Yes, it's not even the only time she mentions margins. Yeah, during in the, the fantasy scenes, she is screaming up margins as well. Which we should get into mm-hmm. that. The fantasy scenes in this movie are great. Just they're incredible. The Black Bart scene is one of like my favorite like Western <laughs> shorts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just a dead on impression of like a very specific type of Western. Yeah, and it's even got that, like, the, the film is sped up a little bit, so it's all kind of uh, hyperactive and a little bit wacky, and it, it looks like the way you would think an old, like, an old Western would look, like an old silent Western, kind of. That's, like, like Bob Clark's attention to detail and all, so many of these little things is, is just kind of remarkable, because, like, everything that he does in this film, it, it, it works. I love <laughs> And I love the fact that, like, when he shoots all of Black Bart's men and they're all lying in a in a, pot, a pile, they all have black X's over their eyes and their tongues are hanging out. <laughs> it's just such a great cartoon yeah, detail. Just, I love just, it. Like, it kind of just distracts you from the fact that Ralph just shot a bunch of fleeing people in the back. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, with a BB gun. He murdered them with that BB gun, though. <laughs> um, Ten more pumps and that thing will break skin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What is that a joke? Oh, from? I'm sorry. That that oh no, that's 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 very yeah. late era Simpsons. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, it was. I'm thinking of very specifically a past its prime Simpsons episode. That's a flashback to Mar- Marge and Homer, and also every other adult in town at camp. And Mo has an air rifle and starts pumping it up. And one of the kids is like, "It's a daisy. Twelve more pumps, and that thing will puncture skin." <laughs> uh God, where was I going with this? Um... <laughs> And the fantasy the, sequences. Yeah, the fantasy scenes. Fantasy scenes, yeah, yeah. And there's the very melodramatic tragedy one where Ralph has soap poisoning because they kept making him eat soap whenever he swore, which apparently he swears he's a lot. Got the, the, he's gone blind. <laughs> like I, I think I think in retrospect, that's the, the the best thing I picked up on is is that obviously Ralph swears way he's too done much. Enough. <laughs> There's also the detail of him having, like, opinions on how yes. soap tastes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the creamy aftertaste. Oh, which man. Which brand of soap. Yeah, which uh, um, the original story that that's mostly based off of is actually, it's a story about Ralph learning, like, overhearing a joke his dad tells that he doesn't understand, but he repeats it to a neighborhood kid anyway. Um, but they don't really go into what the joke is. It just it involves an Irish bartender, and that the punchline involves the word "fuck," which he thinks it's puck, and it's a hockey joke. And oh, my geez. mind is only Incredible. goes to the only thing this joke can be is the "but you fuck one goat" joke. <laughs> what? You don't know that joke? No. Oh, the the to it's 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 kind of a shaggy dog joke. You kind of stretch it out as long as you can, but basically, it's just this guy's at a bar. The bartender's like, you know, I built this bar with my own hands. I've worked here for forty years. Do they call me the bartender? Yeah, they call me oh, the bartender. The bar builder. No, but you fuck one goat. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. Then there's the little orphan Annie story where he he sends off so, like so many box tops to get a Dakota ring, and then all the Dakota ring gets him is more ads for Ovaltine. And um, welcome to marketing yep. 101, kid. The, the whole the whole saga with the lamp, the leg lamp. Yeah. So let's talk about the leg. Which, lamp. It's another piece of merchandise you can buy. My dad has one. My dad has one, too. Listen, y'all, I am currently looking at the website for the Christmas Story House and Museum in Cleveland, Ohio. You can buy basically anything from this movie off their yeah, website. You can just buy Grover Dill. Like, He's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, I my my parents went to the Christmas Story house one year to go just to tour it, and the actor that played Randy in the film showed up to deliver the tour because apparently that's just what he does now. <laughs> that's where his life is at, and that's what he decides to do. And that struck me as so. Fuck sad. it, I'd rather do but that than actually just... <laughs> like go to work. I mean, yeah, but like if you were an actor and your biggest role was something you did when you were seven, congratulations, you are now a museum tour guide. Yeah, and eh. you work like 
not, yeah, you work you like an hour and a half a day, and all you do is just show people around a house. I guess. It's like, I think it was, it might have been Macaulay Culkin, some child actor was like, it's, it was so far in the past that I don't even feel like I did the work, so I just don't have to do anything, because I have all this money that someone else made for me. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and too, because these things get shown every year so often that the royalty checks have to be amazing. Yeah, just think about like someone like Brian Austin Green. You've never seen them since 90210. What are they doing? Just having 90210 money and not having to do anything else. They don't go outside. I mean, I wouldn't. I would say I'd be too ashamed of being on 90210. Cry yourself <laughs> to sleep on a big pile of money. Or you could just do it. I... All my hundreds soaking up my tears. <laughs> you could just do what Ian Ziering did and sell out to the Sharknado series for tens of dollars. Sharknado, the only movie that you have to pay them to be in. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So yeah, so I'm on their website looking at uh, leg lamps, and there is there are Christmas story leg lamps in basically any design or configuration you could possibly want. There's a 50 inch leg lamp. There's a 45 inch leg lamp. There's a 26 inch leg lamp. There's a 20 inch desktop leg lamp. There's a leg lamp. I'm gonna be honest. Throw blanket. 50 50 inches just seems a little too excessive. I mean, unless you just really have a weird giant fetish, I don't know what to tell you. Don't judge me. <laughs> Oh, man. So, yeah, if you just love the leg lamp, this so this website's got you covered. I mean, you can get leg lamp leggings if you want them. You can get leg lamp <laughs> ugly Christmas sweaters. They've got leg lamp scarves, leg lamp necklaces, leg lamp beer koozies. You can get Christmas um, lights for your tree that look like little leg lamps. Yes, absolutely. I'm not I'm not kidding. That's the you can get leg lamp. OK, this is OK. I'm just my mind is slowly melting down you can buy a leg lamp bobble head and instead of the head that bobbles it's the little skirt the lamp <laughs> lampshade skirt <laughs> amazing <laughs> they really figured out a way to sell the fuck out on this entire movie didn't they imagine all funko. the poor little women they had to cut the legs off of to make those <laughs> where's my funko pop of the leg lamp Oh my god! Can you, can you imagine? Can you imagine the beady little eyes they would have to affix to the leg lamp just so that everybody knows this is in fact a Funko Pop? And now we've anthropomorphized a leg. Congratulations, everybody. I am very disappointed to say that while there is a Funko Pop of the old man holding the leg lamp, there is not just the leg lamp itself. <laughs> That's that's a shame. Is, is there a Funko Pop of Ralphie wearing the ridiculous like sequined cowboy outfit and the rabbit outfit? Both of them. Amazing. <laughs> if it wasn't a Funko Pop, I would want Ralphie in the ridiculous like the ridiculous sequin suit. No, there's got to be just a regular action figure of that, right? I mean, we're, we're now we're, we're just straight up talking about merchandise for this film that has to exist. Oh, I, this is by one the way of those, to clear the record. This is one of those uh, f- fragile in Italian is just it's spelled the same, <laughs> but it's pronounced fragile, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, the dad is the dad is being very specifically weird. Like, oh, the dad actually knows Italian, apparently. Um, so my favorite story about that scene is uh, I was like sixteen, and my father and I were out having d- uh, breakfast on Christmas morning at this little diner that had like their family thing there because they owned it. Um. And one of the uncles puts it on in the middle of that scene and just goes, hey, Fragile, it must be Italian. And my father had no clue what he was talking about or what movie this was. And I was, I this was like mid-2000s. I have never been more confused in my life. <laughs> so <laughs> just watching somebody react to that scene and go, I don't under, I've never seen this movie. What movie is this? Oh, my God. How do you make it to like a decade and never see Christmas Story when it's on twenty four hours on Christmas? I mean, the only excuse is you don't have cable, but I, I imagine that's not the well, answer. Well, and that's one of I would argue the more famous like bits from that movie is the leg lamp. Yeah. Like everybody, like you can, people will forget like the Santa Claus thing or like eating soap specifically. Like they'll remember Ralphie swearing when they changed the tire. But they, the fragile and the leg lamp itself are like burned into the American subconscious at this point. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the leg lamp itself is like it's it's such a 
an iconic thing. It's like the sled from uh, Citizen Kane or something. Like it's just that thing that people have to have in their house because they're a lover of. Do they have a Charles Foster Kane uh, Funko Pop? No, Uh, Booker, get on it. (laughs) I know this off the top of my head. I worked at a comic book store and looked at Funko orders for too long. They don't, (laughs) as far as I know. Okay. Does does a comic book store regularly buy Funko Pops of like classic films though? Oh, you would be surprised. Really? Um, we got Golden Girls ones in. Okay, so game set and match. Okay, there's no excuse. Right. I am so disappointed. There is not one. <laughs> How many Christmas story characters are there Funko Pops for? Is the question. Uh, this is a Funko for, Pop would, podcast now. I would bet just the family. I only saw three when I did a very cursory Google search, but yeah, yeah, it looks like just the three. There's not even a there's not even a Randy all bundled up and all that bullshit. That's, that's mildly no, which is wild. There's okay. There's not a Scott Farkas Funko Pop, but there is definitely a Scott Farkas action figure. Um, uh, you can you can get a NECA action figure of Flick with his tongue stuck to the flagpole. You know what's weird? My grandmother had one of those. Now I'm just wanting like a Criterion Funko Pop crossover. Oh. <laughs> Where's my Sancho the Bailiff Funko Pop? Godzilla the Showa era of Funko Pop collection. I, mean, I want a Funko Pop of the head from Zardoz. Where's my Manos the Hands of Fate Funko Pop and Criterion release? Oh, where's my shark? My shark to Funko Pop and Criterion release. There's a Sharknado Funko Pop of of the tornado full of sharks. It's a tornado full of sharks. That's all it is. Do the sharks all have those little beady eyes? I think so. Yeah. Ugh, I hate. Oh, you're right. There it is. Would Funko Pops be anywhere near as bad without the eyes? Like, even if they still had like the the macrocephaly, would they still be as bad without the eyes? Yes. No. No, because I have ones that don't have eyes. They are much better. <laughs> uh, generally, things that like the eyes are covered up, like my Judge Dredd or the embarrassingly complete collection of Power Rangers ones, you don't get eyes. You just get the helmet. Okay, here's a, here's a Chester Cheetah Funko Pop, and this one looks okay because he's got sunglasses on. <laughs> but I look at most of these, and I I just think somebody out there thought, um, I love my my shitty cheap ice cream pop but you know what i really want to do with it put it on a shelf <laughs> and and thus the funko pop was born i own exactly one funko pop and it was given to me as a gift and it's ash from the evil dead mm. and i'm looking at it on my shelf right now and those eyes are staring into my soul so i'm convinced that they would be better without the awful that, beady that seems eyes to be the rule of funko pops is either you have none you have like Less less than three, and they were all given as gifts, or you have 90,000. Yeah, there's no <laughs> in-between. I'm the only person I know to have stopped buying Funko Pops. Like, I have bought too many, and then gone, nah, 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 this is good, this is good, I'm good, I'm good. The, uh, the guy, if you remember a couple of years ago, the guy with the entire room of Funko Pops and, like, the... the deal worked out with his wife about how much he could spend on them. Yeah, we're like, he could spend $80 a week. Uh, Oh, yeah. Fucking wake-up call. Jeez. I was at a a used bookstore a few weeks ago, and I, like, they have a wall of Funko Pops, and I noticed a couple, like, studying the wall, and I I finally figured out what they were doing was they were looking for two Funko Pops to put on their wedding cake. Oh, my God. (laughs) I mean, no, you know what, actually, I'll be, I'm will i okay with it, because people put, like, little action figures or whatever on there, so picking out two cute things that you identify with, that you both like, that's whatever, that's fine. Eh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I shouldn't I shouldn't be one to judge, like, I mean, you guys are on my Christmas movie podcast, and, and we're all having a I good was just time. gonna say. So, like, <laughs> if, if, if we're all th- gonna throw stones here, y'all might as well throw stones at me, because good lord, what are we doing here? I was just gonna say we're recording a podcast about the Christmas a Christmas story like before Thanksgiving. I, I'm just imagining the worst people I could think of doing that, and just like not anybody I even know, just like so like who would be the the people that would make you most roll their your fucking eyes at the that, and they would end up with Deadpool and Daria on top of their cake. Oh my god! Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. You know it's wild. I actually know that couple, the couple that would absolutely do that, and yeah, same. Ugh. Anyway, what we're, what we're coming around to is that, like, A Christmas Story has been, at some point, like, co-opted and picked up by, like, 
corporations as this thing that we can market and sell literally every square inch of for maximum profits. And well, it helps that so many of the scenes revolve around like really iconic and recognizable things. So like the Red Rider BB gun, the mm-hmm. leg lamp. Like, those are just very visually distinct things that you can go, ah, you like Thing? You remember Thing? Yeah, it's Thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the the movie does kind of have an explicitly, like, capitalist message in a way. It's all about wanting something and then getting it. Yeah. uh, It's very consumerist. What's what's the line that Ralphie says about Christmas in the movie? Like, um... We plunged into the cornucopia, quivering with desire and the ecstasy of unbridled avarice. Like he, the, yeah, that yeah, sounds about right. He makes yeah. no yeah. bones about the fact that like they are they are really all just in it for all of the stuff that they can get, well, and that's Christmas. But isn't isn't that line? Line isn't he talking about like him and uh, Randy walking around and like looking at doing window shopping, or him and the, no, the, the other kids? No, the line at the beginning, he actually all... uses the word bacchanalia to describe window shopping. I mean, it's all it's all one and the yeah. same, really. Like at the beginning of the film, they're, all the kids are like window shopping at Higby's and they're looking at all the stuff. But I guess my I guess my argument is, when you are a kid, that's all Christmas is to you because yes. that's all you, that's the thing that you can wrap your brain around about it. Yes, yes, absolutely. And then at the end, you know, old Ralphie is looking back on young Ralphie opening all his Christmas presents and just saying, "Yes, this was a a cornucopia of." of uh, materialistic delights. Basically. Yeah, it's like old Ralphie and, going, like, "Wow, yeah. I was kind of an asshole." <laughs> I mean, yeah, but I mean, see, uh, so a Christmas story at its heart is, yeah, it's a very uh, materialistic, capitalistic story about a kid who just wants a gun. But also, it, all of the things surrounding that are what make it the film that people love to watch every year. Like Ralphie and the gun and and the leg lamp; those are small parts of a, of a bigger film, of a bigger story about just people dealing with each other around the yeah holidays. i mean there's a good chance you can relate to one part of the story or another like you can relate to the little orphan annie like bullshit about like being disappointed once you finally like figure out the when, when once once the ruse is lifted basically you know about like the getting in the fight with a bully the thing about like the di- dinner being ruined and going out to a chinese restaurant on christmas like e- everyone can going to relate to one of these stories or another in some way even if they don't relate to the like entire narrative as a whole and it helps that the movie's very sort of sardonic about everything. It, it, Like, it knows that it is being materialistic, and it's commentating on that. It's not just putting the out the idea, hey, getting stuff is good. But it's still what say, the core of the movie's about. Even though the main plot's about him wanting to get something, there's still the point where, like, he gets the Dakota ring and realizes that, you know, this is all just an act. A- just an ad just like a whole crummy yeah it's it's the it's a very 80s thing where it recognizes the, like the materialistic greed and the bullshit of it all but it's just kind of like eh, but actually i like it so I'm, I'm looking at a photograph right now of uh costumes from a deleted scene that i want to share with you guys real quick you oh please tell us about okay it. <laughs> so i'm gonna drop it into the uh the discord here if let's see if this works yes there it goes um, there was a deleted scene at one point, uh, another uh, uh, fantasy sequence where Ralphie is imagining himself helping Flash Gordon fight Ming the Merciless with his Red Rider BB gun. Amazing. That's amazing. And they actually shot this footage. I've never seen it. I don't think it's ever been on any like DVD release. This movie was about to was about to get like even more fanciful and out there and the fact that that stuff exists is kind of amazing to me like i love like they just straight up went for it and made like a ming the merciless costume and a flash gordon costume and put ralphie in basically like a family guy cutaway scene (laughs) that's what it looks like to me oh my god that's incredible why isn't the i i would give anything for I would give anything for that footage. If 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 we can if we can't find it, you know, if someone out there on the internet has it, knows about it, like I would absolutely love to see that scene because I don't know where it would fit in the film. I don't know if it would like be thematically relevant, but it just seems like a a fun kind of thing that they would have been able to pull off. I, I don't think it would work because the I think the reason like the western stuff and the wicked witch stuff is it's that all works because it feels like it's of that time or a further throwback and more nostalgia for another time. Yeah. But if you do sci-fi, you're looking at the future from a different time period and you either have to do that 
or not do that. You can't do that a little bit. It's also very on the nose if it's just explicitly Flash Gordon. Like you can slot the cowboy scene into just about any western, but if it's if it's just literally Flash Gordon, then it's not so much of a uh, a conceptual like fantasy scene as much as it is just a specific yeah, reference. Um, Chris Storyhouse website says that none of the footage uh, exists anymore, but Aww. they do have scripts of well, the deleted scenes up though. Well, two, I guess, I guess there's it doesn't need to exist because like like you said like uh, filming this in the 80s about the 40s you can kind of skate by with saying oh ralphie's uh mimicking some western whether it's red rider or roy rogers whatever you know you can kind of hand wave that but you know flash gordon was a feature film as recently as 1980 so like people would be familiar with that and go oh this is kind of weird so I, I guess I understand that. I yeah, with, that. yeah, with the forties. I mean, even if you're a kid in the eighties, you're gonna understand. Like, even if you don't understand it through any other context, you understand like the westerns through Looney Tunes. You're right. and the only, and you're not probably not going to be as familiar with Flash Gordon unless you really know or just really a big Queen fan. I guess maybe, <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe that's true. But uh, so yeah, I mean, the, I guess all I'm getting at is that a Christmas story could have been wackier. And they decided to tone it back because they knew they probably knew that was going to be a step too far. And the the cutaways, the the fantasy scenes are definitely the wackiest part of the movie. The rest of it is all just very, very mundane. Yeah, yeah, and there there aren't even that many uh, fantasy sequences in this movie. You know, there's the the uh, the black the black Bart scene. There's the Wicked Witch with the teacher. There's the uh, the one when he's writing the theme where he's imagining her loving it. There. There's Black Bart and there's the soap blindness. Yeah, so there's uh, just I don't think there's a I don't think there's any more. I think there's only like four. Yeah, it's the, and they're all very short. There's, there, there's yeah. yeah, there's so, Black Bart, the soap blindness, the teacher grading. Um, is is there one more? I don't think so. I think that's a Wicked Witch. There's the one when she's the Wicked Witch. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I love. That. I never, I never really noticed that that was. The, I never really put together that, that was the Wicked Witch as the teacher. What made it sink home was when he talked about his mom. Then she shows up in a jester outfit. Like it's clearly the same actress as the mom. Right. Yeah. Like I never put that together <laughs> this time. Um, but yeah, from this website, what it's saying too is that a lot of the deleted scenes they were basically cut because MGM wanted a ninety-minute movie to play in the theaters every two hours. Yeah, so it, it makes sense. It wasn't even about the tone. It was about it was another craven uh, marketing move, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. We need this movie to work for a matinee. We gotta air it as many times as possible. Just picturing some dude with a huge cigar saying that as he cuts out parts of a Christmas movie. Mom and Dad want to see Ralphie ten times a day. Not until nineteen ninety seven. You won't. Uh, so let me read to y'all. Uh, here's a, a a quote from Gene Shepard as he's describing like his his, his image of uh, mom and dad Parker. He says, uh, "I saw the old man as a guy who grew up hustling pool games at the age of twelve and was supporting himself at the age of fourteen. So dad is kind of, I mean, in the forties, dad is has 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 seen some shit and he's I don't know I guess old enough to settle down, but he's also kind of a." a huckster in his own right. I don't know what he does for a living, yeah. but you can kind of tell that he's, yeah, he does. He, he's probably like a really conniving person. And then of, of the mom, it says, uh, Ralphie's mother is the kind of woman I figure grew up in a family of four or five sisters and married young. She digs the old man, but also knows he's dangerous as a snake. <laughs> Which you don't really get a lot of in the movie because like mom and dad don't uh, have too many scenes alone. And when they do, it's mostly about the kids. Yeah, it's the yeah the the parents don't really even seem to ha- be too affectionate to each other, except in a couple of scenes. They just they more seem to exist in order to keep these kids from killing themselves, basically. Which again, that kind of makes sense when you're viewing it through the lens of the kids. They're not going to see their parents being like parents, like like adults. They're going to see them as just like caretakers. Right. Yeah. There's that one scene after after. Ralphie beats up Scott Farkas and worries that his dad's gonna, you know, destroy him. And then when when it doesn't happen, he kind of looks at his mom in a different light, like, "Oh, okay, this is this mom is out, actually kind of out to look look out for me." Which, yeah, my and, favorite scene in the yeah. movie, actually, one on that note is is after Ralphie like sh- like shoots himself in the face with the BB gun because he puts he puts the target on a fucking metal sign. He manages to, like, ricochet and shoot himself in the face, then steps on his glasses, and he quickly thinks up some story about an icicle hitting him in the face, 
Then when his mom takes him back in and starts like fussing over him with like the 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 40s version of first aid, which is basically just a jar of iodine and nothing else. Um, mm-hmm. He like looks straight at the camera, and Gene Shepard says she bought it, and he like just <laughs> mugs for the camera for a few seconds. That's the only time in the film he does that too. Like it's the only time they even acknowledge the fourth wall in this movie. Yeah, and and that's like the thing that. The thing that launched, like, so many other, like, copycat movies, I think. Yeah, like, the entire reason the fucking Wonder Years exists is because of this movie. Yeah, yeah. Or I was even think- specifically thinking of, like, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Like, yeah. That's the kind of shit that Ferris Bueller yeah, does. like, Ferris Bueller and Wayne's World, I could definitely see them being f- being inspired in, in some direction from this. In the commentary, Bob Clark says that he actually introduced Gene Shepard to Steven Spielberg for the Wonder Years. And the two hated each other. <laughs> and if they hadn't, Gene Shepard was also going to narrate the Wonder Years. Oh my god. <laughs> I don't know that I would have cared too much. I mean, I don't care too much for the Wonder Years anyway, because I'm not Yeah, old, well, they, they, but they, here's the problem. The, Gene Shepard was like 40 in the 1960s. Um, I'm looking at uh, some of the other things that are related to uh, like the differences between the script and the original filming. Originally, Grover Dill was the main bully, which in the original book, the story is about Grover Dill, and Scott was the little toady. But they had already cast Yano An- Anaya as Grover and, Sc- and Zach Ward as Scott Farkas, which, like, that relationship doesn't really work. You don't have the tall guy be the toady, so as soon as yeah. they saw that, they switched them around. That's the right. reason they swapped them? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, but the original line after Ralphie attacks uh, uh, in this Dill, but Scott, is... Bravery does not exist, just a kind of latent nuttiness. If I had thought about attacking Dill for ten seconds before I had done it, I would have been four blocks away in a minute flat. That's accurate. Mm. Anything anything else that we need to discuss about A Christmas Story before we kind of wrap things up? The best joke in the movie is when they give the dad the bowling ball and they just drop it right on his nuts. <laughs> just, I, I never caught it as a kid for some reason. I didn't make the connection that they just dropped a bowling ball on his nuts. And then one day I noticed it, and it's the best. Something that I didn't notice until uh, one or two years ago, watching it, you know, on Christmas, is after you know after Christmas is over and Ra- and Randy's like asleep on the floor with his Zeppelin, lying next to him on the floor is a Frankenstein mask. Yeah, and, that's. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Th- that's a reference to the book. Oh, is it? Yeah, I think Randy gets that. That's the present he got for Ralph in the book, and and he was like, "That's the only present that that any of them had got me that I actually thought I could get any use out of." <laughs> <laughs> but that's like one of those like little details that you just don't pick up on the first hundred times you see it and then like i spotted that and said hey dad did you see that and he's like no what so we had to wait for the next screening of a christmas story to come back around <laughs> so i was i was primed Amazing. for like dad look frankenstein <laughs> <laughs> uh have any of you seen the uh the stage adaptation of it no is that is that it's, different from like the live like version they put on TV? It's yes, cause I think the live version they put on TV is literally just a live. It's like that live Woody Allen movie they did like a year or so ago. Um, this is literally the Christmas Story adapted as a like a stage play, and it's surprisingly good. I think because it's so episodic, and you can just break down the scene into, and now we're doing this, and now we're doing this, and you don't have a ton of transition in between them because you just go from one episode to the next. Right. Yeah. So like all, all of the, like the scene changes and all the, you know, it's just baked right into the thing and you just have the guy doing narration over it while they quick, you know, reset the stage. Oh, that's actually kind of brilliant. Yeah. I would love to see that sometime. Yeah. I saw it a couple of years ago at Christmas time. It was pretty good. I'll have to keep an eye out for that. Um, There's also, uh, like we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, there are there is an actual legitimate sequel to this movie directed by Bob Clark, and you know we 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 might do an episode on it you know sometime next year, but it's from 1994 and it's called My Summer Story, and it's actually a an, an adaptation of like other stories of of the Parker family, uh, starring I want to say it's Charles Grodin and Mary Steenburgen and his mom and dad. And yeah. And what, Kieran Culkin. Kieran yeah. Culkin, yes, as Ralphie. And Christian Culkin as Randy. When it, wherever there's one Culkin, there must be another. Why are there That's so like many a rule, Culkins? right? Um, the travel yeah, packs. And also, just uh, for a little bit of clarity, yeah, some people I know this as it runs in the family. It's the same thing. Yes, yes. Glenn Shaddix is also in it, and I think that makes it perfect already. <laughs> so there is... 
one true Christmas story part two, and it's it's it it's, it runs in the family, not anything else. Um, not what's the other one called? There's Adi, Ollie Hopnerville's Haven of Bliss, which was written That's by it. Shepard, but it was like a directed TV movie. That's the which one. Had, I can never had Jerry O'Connell in it as Ralphie. Whoa. Yeah, I can never remember the name of that for obvious reasons, because that's a stupid title. Uh, and then I guess there's, you know, has anybody else been to the Christmas Story House in Cleveland? I, I try not to go to Cleveland. I, was to say, I make it a point not to be in Cleveland at any given time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was in Cleveland a few years ago, so I, you know, why not? I, I had to be in Cleveland, so I thought I, would, I might do it. And, I don't think um, I've ever been remarkably close to Cleveland, even. <laughs> So like there there were there were two landmarks I had to see. I had to go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame where I got to see Skrillex's broken laptop behind glass. That's a, that was <laughs> Ooh. my favorite thing ever. No, uh, but also the Christmas Story House where I'm going to tr- drop another uh, photograph into the chat. There is you know there's the scene where after Ralphie beats up Scott Farkas, Randy thinks that you know Dad's going to kill Ralphie and he he hides underneath the sink to basically hide his fear and shame and what all. And the the sink is there in the house and you can get under it and they made me get under it and I damn near broke the thing. And <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they almost kicked me out of the house because I was very clearly about to break the sink. But they ask you to get under it themselves though? No, my dad made me get under oh it. Oh my oh, okay. god. <laughs> <laughs> Banned from the Christmas Story house is definitely something you could put on a resume. <laughs> <laughs> it's like how I spent my summer vacation. I got banned from the Christmas Story house in August. I can check that. It was in August. How did you know? Um, oh. <laughs> All good stories happen in August. That's true. I, I, I'm just I'm just imagining someone's like Twitter bio, like blocked by Mike Pence, banned from Christmas Story house. <laughs> Kicked it's out of Cleveland. A, it's got a real drill tweet vibe to it. <laughs> That's my that's my bucket list sorted, buddy. They won't even let me fuck the Red Rider baby gun. <laughs> the only thing left on my bucket list is I want to go to the Conagra Foods headquarters and see the statue of uh, Chef Boyardee. That's it. That's all I got. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to see the final pee into the, to corporate consumption, and then I can die a happy man. I want to go to Japan and see the Colonel Sanders dressed as Goku. Wait, that's real? Yeah. I have to Google this. I'm going to uh, uh, amend my bucket list. Hang on just a second here. Oh my god, this is the greatest thing ever. You gotta put it in the show notes now. (laughs) Um, It's absolutely incredible. That's a fantastic find. Oh man. I, I, I love how, like, the show notes always just get... I love looking at the looking at the your blurbs you make for the show, Joe, and just seeing what stupid shit makes into the show notes. Because now Dumb. our episode about the Christmas story has to have Colonel Sanders dressed up like Goku in in the show notes. Could have uh, Colonel Sanders dressed up like an Ava unit. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I put a question on Twitter the other day, and I asked, like, do people even? Oh my Get god! <laughs> right? <laughs> people even? look at the show notes and it was like two to one yes so i guess i have to continue making show notes so please go to christmascreeps.com at the end of this episode and look at all the dumb bullshit that we talked about in this episode we have to post funko pops in there yes we have to put i will put the sharknado funko pop in there yes thank god uh so i guess uh, any final thoughts on a christmas story before we move on no it's a classic if you haven't seen it i don't you're behind on the cultural conversation, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it's it lasts along with Christmas Vacation for kind of a lot of the same reasons. It's a story about Christmas rather than being about something that happens at Christmas. Um, it has that eight, like even though it came out, even though it's about the '40s, came out in the '80s. It has that '80s nostalgia to it because it came out in the '80s. You know, it. I, I a lot a large part of this is definitely rose colored glasses. I would guess for all of us involved, but. I, fuck it, whatever. There's got to be a point where no one who is alive in the 40s is still alive, and this is going to be people's main way of understanding what life was like back then. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, That's... it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like that scene in Idiocracy where they go to the museum, and it's like, uh, Charlie Chaplin fought in World War II against FDR. <laughs> Would you say that Idiocracy will finally become a documentary? 
I wouldn't because people who say that are terrible. <laughs> but that's just me. I th- for my part, like I think this movie like kind of I don't know, like the reputation this movie has as like a squeaky clean kind of um like happy, fun Christmas movie is kind of wrong-headed because like on both sides of it, like the short stories were published in Playboy magazine, and the whole reason it was funded was because Bob Clark made porkies. Uh, so, yeah, real quick, because I was looking at the Wikipedia page about all this, they were specifically they were published in Playboy because Shel Silverstein encouraged him to write down the stories he told on the radio. <laughs> That's even which better. Is incredible. That's even better. everything, everything good in this world goes back to Shel Silverstein. Boy named Sue, also Shel Silverstein. Absolutely. And like the like the fact that this movie has like a, like a squeaky clean kind of reputation, like you look at the logo and it's like the, the the title of the movie and then Ralphie's like stupid smiling face right there, like oh isn't that adorable? No, this movie is fucking real. <laughs> it's like this movie and kids, like right there together. <laughs> Ugh, wow. Jesus. I, I went I went some places there. Anyway, yeah, it's a, it's a Christmas story. Who doesn't love a Christmas story? Um, and with that in mind, let's go over to the Crankometer, where we rate and score these movies on an X and Y axis. Y'all know the drill. Uh, X axis, Christmasity, how Christmas is a Christmas story. Five? Incredibly. Wait, it, what's our scale here? Yeah, it's from negative five, five to positive five. Five. Oh, Six. five. Six. Six? What's happened uh, before? It is the most Christmas a movie can be. It is a... It is about family and also consumerism. Listen, okay. Jesse has brought a motion to the floor to de- deliver a six on the Christmas story. Who seconds it? Yeah. I'm with it. Okay. I've I've already been outvoted, so this is officially a six. <laughs> yes. My How lasting contribution to the internet, folks. It's yes, yeah, this and fucking what? What 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 else? Die Hard, I think. Uh Surviving Edge Weapons is gonna be the <laughs> other one. We haven't watched that one yet. Oh, that's not really a Christmas movie, but you should watch it on here anyway as a Christmas it's, movie. Wait, so Surviving Edged Weapons is like super duper Christmassy, is what you're saying? Right it's, well, yeah, you know what? Yeah, All of it, the edged weapons involved are icicles. <laughs> <laughs> They've been known to kill people. What is the icicle that falls on Ralphie but an edged weapon? <laughs> yes, this is very true. Oh, man. Christmas Vacation was, I believe, a 5-6. Yeah, we do. I, what am I? What am I saying here? We have the ac- the actual expert on the crankometer right here with us to tell us these things. <laughs> yes, you're I right. Pull up my archives and make completely sure about that. What, whatever the whatever the score, we've kind of landed on a six. So forget that. Uh, we're gonna jump over to the y-axis, uh, the quality quotient, if you will. Uh, how good is a Christmas story? And again, I feel like we're gonna land on a very high number here. Okay, here's a legitimate question. How do we feel about um, the Chinese Christmas dinner? Ooh, yeah, that part. Mm. Ugh. Ugh. It, is the eight, it is definitely a movie made in the 80s depicting a time that was somehow even more racist. Yeah, I will, I will say it's, 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 for what this is worth, it's not worse than literally anything else made in the 80s involving Asian characters. It's not worse than 16 Candles. It's not worse than Revenge of the Nerds. So... I also want to point out that this this Chinese restaurant is named the Bo Ling uh, Asian cuisine, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and there's the, the the bowling sign where the W's been like knocked out. It's not a great. I mean, it's it's an all right joke, but like it's not a great joke. <laughs> uh, that's but that's why the old man wanted went there is because it's bowling. Like, oh, that is the, that is the joke. Yeah, I, yeah, I I'm imagining it's that. it's the Chinese restaurant right, right next to the bowling alley. So of course he knows where it is. That makes way too much sense. So you're absolutely right. I guess what we're saying is this is definitely a four. We're knocking off one point for uh, one point for racism. For racism, yeah. I mean, it could definitely have been a lot worse. It, I mean, it really could have. The fantasy sequences could have been accidentally racist. Um, they weren't. Ralphie does shoot some black people, but that's beside the point. He also shoots white people, which I think we can all agree is good. So on that He's note, a- there are. Despite this taking place in the Midwest in the '40s, there are a way more than you'd think non-white characters in this. Or not characters, but just like people, just in general. They're not really characters because they're background. But like his student has like three or four black kids. His class has like three or four black students in it, which is completely anachronistic. There's no way the school wouldn't be segregated. Not that it should have been, but it's just like that's that kind of stood out. And then in the beginning montage of just the Christmas stuff, there is specifically like a group of black carolers singing "Go Tell It on the Mountain." 
yeah. I'm gonna chalk. Hmm. I'm gonna chalk this up to being produced in the '80s at the, as you know an excuse to have any people of color in the film at all. Yeah. So I'm gonna say the, the movie needs a little bit of merit for that. I would say of, of actually making the effort to just not having just a, a bunch of honkies show up and that's it. Mm. Pretty much. Even even though yeah, I, I mean you know you know where we're gonna go with this. Like even yeah. though. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that for the '80s, like, I mean, yeah, it's 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 purely token appearances, but for the '80s, that was still better than most people were fucking doing at the time. True, true. For uh, the '80s, even the the racism isn't that bad, which is uh, you know loaded, but right, like racism against Asians wasn't really a thing in the '80s. It was, but it wasn't a recognized. Oh no, it was. It was a. It was a funny joke in the eighties. It was still funny in the eighties. Is what? Yeah, is what I'm saying. I mean, it happens and then it's over with. It's not you know sixteen candles where it just keeps happening over and over, and that is the entirety (laughs) of a joke. It is one joke and then it's done, and you're on to the next thing. But also, even there's there's still like a nugget of truth in that because like on Christmas, who who are who's open? The Chinese restaurants and sheets and sheets. And then it gets immediately overshadowed by one of the best jokes in the movie. The, Which is uh, what? The, the when duck. they cut the head off the duck. Oh, that's oh, a, yeah. They specifically gave the actress playing the mom a different script so that she didn't know what was going to happen. Of course. <laughs> of fucking course. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mom was completely, like, flabbergasted by that. That's great. <laughs> and then, yeah. So that's... I, I think we're going to land on a, a four yeah. for quality. Because... Yeah. A point off for accidental racism. It is what it is. Uh, so, hey, Booker, you're here for me to tell you this. If you wouldn't mind, please uh, chart this one as a 6-4 on our crankometer. Aye, aye, Captain. Thank you. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Wait, wait. On the Christmas Story House, opens year-round, seven days a week, some major holidays. The Christmas Story House is closed on Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I also know that that house is in a real neighborhood, and the people who live around that house fucking hate it, because everyone, every tourist parks on the street. Fun facts about the Christmas Story House. If you go, uh, be mindful of the people who actually live there. Oh, boy. So we've, we've had a, a fun time on, on this episode talking about um, a, a Christmas movie that we all actually enjoy, and I can't wait to watch it at least four times on Christmas Eve. But not all at once, just in completely separate chunks. Yeah, I'm going to watch five minutes of it, then take a nap, then watch ten more minutes that took place before the five minutes I watched for Eva later. <laughs> then, it's, then it's time for eat. And one of the fun things now is, if you watch it on either TNT or TBS, you can flip back and forth and they'll be in different spots. Because one starts at 8pm and the other starts at 9. So they have that it staggered. That rules. That's amazing. <laughs> they have it staggered for your viewing pleasure. Asynchronous Christmas story marathons. <laughs> <laughs> so you could theoretically have two TVs and watch them both at the same time. <laughs> Get double the Christmas story. Have it play like rounds in a song. I have and to do that this year. Now I'm imagining like a like a like a, a script or like an algorithm that just takes the Christmas story scenes and chops them up and reorders them and sees the movie still makes sense. <laughs> I, I think it I, does. I think there's only a couple yeah, things like, you have to put in a specific order. Yeah, as like, long as you have, as long as you have the, the Christmas be- has to go at the end. Yeah, the, the, you have to have the beginning and the end, but everything else in the middle can just be jumbled up, and it'd probably still more or less work. It's like a choose your own adventure book. I Wait. fed all of the words for "In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash" to a neural network, and it spat out this Christmas story. <laughs> Please, somebody listening, try that out. I want to see what the results are. (laughs) The last thing that I'll say before we wind up tonight is that uh, from our last episode where we had Dr. Nick on to talk about Black Christmas, I made a joke that I wanted to put the final, like Ralphie's final narration from A Christmas Story over the closing shot from Black Christmas. I did. I did that. Last week, I haven't put it on the internet yet. I will put it up for this episode, but I will say as soon as I did it, I felt like I had willed something terrible into existence and which, I broke part of the universe. Which Black Christmas, though? That's the, the important or, question. The original. All right. Yeah. So, so you know you know how A Christmas Story, you know, Ralphie gives his final narration about the Red Red BB gun and then it, it, it uh, fades out to the shot of the house as it's snowing and the credits come up. 
Yeah. And they play We Wish You a Merry Christmas. And then in Black Christmas, it's kind of the same shot, but the camera's zooming out from the house and you see the dead body in the attic and it's just dead quiet and the phone is ringing. Amazing. So I put the video of that with the phone ringing in the background and I felt like I had done something terrible. Like <laughs> This is a thing that should not exist and now it does and you all have to suffer for it. I'm so sorry. You performed a dark ritual. Yes, I have. I have willed a, a Christmas demon into into our plane of existence. Uh, so, anywho, on that on that bright and chipper note, that's going to round out our episode uh, this week for Christmas creeps. Uh, I I want to thank uh, Booker and Jesse for coming by to talk about uh, Christmas story. I've had a blast. Yeah, same. Thanks for having me. It was always a pleasure. Y'all are welcome back anytime. Uh, J Five, thanks for joining me as well. Yeah, I'm just imagining like. It must be kind of not dissimilar to hell if you lived on the street. Like, if you lived in that house that's next to the Christmas Story house, across the street from the Christmas Story house gift shop. <laughs> Basically, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it's hell. It's just, it's just not unlike hell. At a certain point, you have to move to that neighborhood knowing that that house is there, right? So what you're saying is you're moving there? No. Having been a tourist there, I don't want to live anywhere near it. I imagine it is working retail and having Christmas start earlier and earlier every year, except Christmas never actually stops except on Christmas. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nowadays Christmas ends like the week before Christmas. It's insane. It's absolute, utter insanity. And, you know, that's what we're here for. So, uh, so yeah. If you want to leave us comments or questions or anything like that, you can email us at xmascreeps at gmail.com or go to Twitter and follow us at Christmas Creeps. Um, or go to YouTube or Stitcher or Google Play. And, you know, we're also on those platforms as well. Apple Podcasts. Wherever you get podcasts. Except for Spotify. Because I don't trust that shit. Um, and, yeah. We have one more episode coming up uh, this month. And then it is off to the races for the holidays. So, definitely check in with us uh, right about uh, Black Friday for your next episode, your next fix of Christmas Creeps. Um, so, I guess that's going to round it out. For Christmas Creeps, I'm Joseph Wade. I'm Johnny Five, the Hebrew Robot. I'm Jesse. And I'm Booker. Wishing everyone a happy middle November. Good night. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Ba 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 